Hey, 2100, we're doing the mechanical equivalent of heat today. So let me give you a quick rundown of the purpose of this lab. So uh, back in the day, there was this mysterious fluid called the caloric. And um, it was thought that all objects, even this little piece of chalk, had this certain amount of caloric fluid in it. And if you break it up, crush it, chop it up into pieces, the smaller pieces of this chalk couldn't contain as much of this fluid as the original whole. So some of it leaked out. Um, and that's where we got the phenomena of like heat temperature. Um, so there's, guy, there's this guy, um, Rumford, Count Rumford, <clears throat> and his job was to uh, drill holes in cannons. So he's drilling away I'm doing this, I don't know, in the 1800s. How the hell did they drill holes? Well, whatever. He's drilling a hole in the cannon and it's generating uh, heat. Uh, it's getting hotter, it, it, as expected, because the drill bit is getting all chopped up, ground to little bits and pieces, and he's making this hole. But he um, came to the realization that when the bit gets um, very dull and smooth, um, so that it's not breaking up anymore and he's no longer drilling a hole in the cannon, there's still an increase in temperature. So he could um, increase the process, increase the, the speed in which he's drilling and it just gets hotter, 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 hotter. So what, are the, what is the significance of that? It is that it kind of blows the whole caloric theory out of the water, so to speak. And that's because this fluid, it, it, each piece of material has this set amount of fluid in it, right? But if he kept doing mechanical work on this drill, it's like this fluid is never ending. So it's BS, right? Um, there had He suspected that temperature is directly related to mechanical work, or in other words, Mechanical energy from mechanical mechanical work may po quite possibly be the same thing as energy that creates or uh, gives the phenomena of temperature. Well, it took about 50 years later for our guy Jules to actually do an experiment where he pretty much conclusive, conclusively proved that they are one and the same. So we have mechanical energy that is totally easy to calculate, right? It's nothing more than, <clears throat> uh, what is it? The integral of the dot product between a force and displacement, the displacement of the force applied at a particular um, location. He devised this paddle wheel here. He could do mechanical work um, on this system. Say this is mass M, this here is some height H, as this falls, we have two masses. We do work on the system, which is equal to two times MGH. Now, that is the mechanical energy that goes into the system. Uh, these uh, strings or ropes are wrapped around a, um, uh, a rod there, and it gets this paddle wheel spinning. There's water in this container and it's thermally isolated. How he was able to do this back in 1850, I have absolutely no idea. Guys were pretty clever back then. Um, so, well, we're still clever today, right? But anyway, um, he was able to determine the increase in temperature of that water after his experiment. And it was known that, um, well, let's go back to that caloric fluid. You can determine how much fluid uh, came out of something with the simple expression mc delta t. It was the mass of the object given off the caloric. C is the specific heat, and this is nothing more than the change in temperature of that object. So, uh, measuring the mass of the water inside, he knows the specific heat of water, he measures the temperature before and after, so he determines how much caloric went into that, uh, into that water. He also knows how much mechanical work he did to increase that temperature. So he took the ratio of work to, we'll call this Q, work Q. He took the ratio of work and Q and saw that it equaled some value. I'm just gonna call it beta for right now. So 
he did this several times. How about uh, putting different masses and doing the experiment all over again, determining the change of temperature, this ratio? He got beta again. How about changing the height? How about changing the amount of water? Just tweaking all the parameters. When all is said and done, the ratio of the mechanical work that he put into the system and the amount of caloric, that fluid that was generated, always uh, came out to be the same uh, number. In other words, <clears throat> these two things are the same thing. Not caloric. Nothing more than good old-fashioned energy. And this is a... a goes without saying an extremely important concept because you know it led to uh, uh, conservation of energy now that was Joule's original experiment we could do a different experiment by putting in mechanical work uh, differently say this is a conveyor belt and this is a mass on top of the conveyor belt and this mass is anchored to the ground so when I start spinning this conveyor belt in this direction, I'm going to get friction here. Now, how much friction? That's easy to calculate <clears throat> because let's say this is a block of mass M. Uh, friction would be in that area, right? Right here, we have tension in the, in the rope. So this isn't moving, but there is a frictional force here. And that uh, frictional force is equal to what uh, we have a normal force the normal force is normal force is equal to mg frictional force is equal to the normal force times the coefficient of kinetic friction so our frictional force is equal to nothing more than mg uk <clears throat> so if i get this spinning all I need to know is the distance this belt traveled, let's say it is X, and multiply that by this frictional force, and that is equal to the work imparted on this system. So here's the work done. I measure the temperature of that belt, take the ratio, and I should get beta. Again, okay, let me quit calling it beta. It is 4.180, what's today's accepted value? In most textbooks it's 187, but I think technically it's 4.184, I wanna say. But anyway, I'm gonna get this number, and this would be, um, of course, uh, joules per calorie. So, in whatever process we could imagine doing as far as introducing mechanical work onto a system uh, we and the result then of that the result of that work is uh, uh, an increase in temperature uh, we know that uh, you know the ratio of the two will be that number there uh, well okay maybe with <laughs> I I don't want to start naming a bunch of exceptions but um, um, I mean, what if some of this um, energy turned into, okay, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> um, bottom line is, w this is known as the mechanical equivalent of heat. Now, as I said before, uh, Jules discovered that mechanical uh, work, which uh, introduces energy across the boundary of a system, and heat, which is energy... Uh, crossing uh, the boundary, you know, uh, 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 of, uh, of two objects in, in um, uh, thermal contact with each other. That it, this ratio is known as the uh, mechanical equivalent of heat. And it sounds kind of weird, mechanical equivalent of heat, if they're both the same thing. But it's just called that for historical uh, reasons, the reasons that we just discussed. <laughs> so um, what we are going to do today is find the ratio of this and demonstrate that these two items, um, work and heat, are indeed related because the ratio is always going to uh, turn out to be the same thing. So this was Jill's experiment. We're not going to do that. We're going to do something closer to this here. 
problem with this though in practical terms is that uh, this belt here it'd be extremely difficult to determine the temperature of that belt initially in, 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 uh, in its final um, uh, or after the uh, work was introduced what its final temperature would be and uh, the reason being is that I mean surface area this thing is spinning uh, energy would leak out into the atmosphere what we are going to do is Uh, we'll have a cylinder and we'll wrap a rope around that cylinder and on one end of the cylinder one end of the rope we're going to have a mass so we are going to crank this cylinder so that the frictional force um, introduced by the work we're doing on the crank is going to lift this object and it, it's pretty clever because um, because of the equations of uh, work done as far as rotational uh, motion work is what uh, the product of torque and uh, theta where theta is the angular displacement of this object we will be able to determine exactly how much work we put into our system and simply measure determine the temperature of that cylinder before we started imparting the work on it and after this is an aluminum cylinder. Okay, part of it's made of plastic, but good for us, plastic has a very, very, very close specific heat to aluminum, so it should all work out. Uh, 0.220. So we know the specific heat. We'll find the mass, specific heat mass. We'll measure, we'll determine the temperature before and after, so we'll easily be able to uh, determine how much um, energy was introduced into uh, this cylinder here. So let's see. Oh, the displacement. Well, we just need to keep track of how many times we uh, crank this cylinder, right? And then the total displacement would be nothing more than 2 pi times that displacement. Um, or two, two, 2 pi times the number of times we, we cranked. Uh, that cylinder. So, with that said, let's take a look at our equipment that we'll be using. Let me put you on pause. Okay, before we get started, let's talk about this equipment. And the reason being is that during the experiment, I'm going to zoom in on this multimeter. The object of interest is the uh, temperature of that uh, cylinder which could be determined by the resistance measured on this digital multimeter uh, the resistance of that thermistor inside of that cylinder so you're not going to see um, uh, all of the equipment in in, in, in in view so let's talk about that equipment so you get a full understanding of what exactly is going on so this is our pasco uh, crank here is our cylinder. Here is our 10 kilogram approximately uh, weight. Actually, it's 9.95 kilograms. But anyway, what we do is we wrap this cord around the cylinder and then we start to crank. So as soon as I start to crank, I'm going to impart a frictional force uh, between the cylinder and this rope. Now, as you can see right now, if I start cranking, obviously, or intuitively, you know that this thing isn't going to uh, lift up off my lap here. And so why is that? How am I going to get it uh, to lift? Well, we need to wrap this uh, cord an appropriate number of times around this cylinder so that friction can do its work. Furthermore, what we need to do is apply tension on this string. We need to give it a little tug with our hand. now. Um, suppose I wasn't cranking this and I just pulled this. Now, you would know that I could indeed lift this mass above the ground if I pulled this hard enough. So during the experiment, when I'm providing attention on this string, I'm not cheating. I'm not doing that so that I could help lift this bucket above the ground. That would render our uh, experiment uh, somewhat uh, useless. 
What I'm doing is I'm applying attention in this direction for the sole purpose of giving friction a chance to work. And what I mean by that is that by giving this a little bit of tension, I'm properly seating this cord on this cylinder. I'm allowing there to be um, um, weight, if you will. <clears throat> In other words, if I have a block if I, a, of mass uh, sitting on the table and I push it, there is definitely gonna be a frictional force, right? Where does that force come from? It comes from um, gravity. Um, there's a normal force and that's how you determine the force of friction, right? It's, it ha it, it's proportional to the normal force of that mass. Well, there's hardly any normal force on this cord. Um, <clears throat> at rest, some parts of the cord aren't even really touching that cylinder. So I want to give it just <clears throat> a little bit of tension and that just properly seats it. None of that tension um, that I impart on this cord is being used to lift this above the ground just to properly seat this cord. <clears throat> the question is, is how much tension? By the way, <clears throat> during the experiment while I'm cranking it, if you're doing it with your hand, you got to constantly be adjusting the tension that you're applying to the cord so it makes uh, applying a consistent torque about this cylinder kind of challenging. So there's a clever way to do it and that way is to attach a rubber band on one end. So what you do is you hook this rubber band um, uh, onto a hook and initially <clears throat> it's going to be uh, stretched. Uh, it, it's going to be stretched while this uh, sits on the ground <clears throat> and there is a, a, a larger than desired tension in that rope. Once you start cranking, the tension produced by the motion of this cylinder and that larger than desired tension in this rope from the rubber band lifts your can, but then it reaches a particular, as it gets higher, this rope uh, moves to your right. And it move, as it moves to the right, the rubber band doesn't stretch as much so it finds this sweet spot where this is elevated above the ground and there is next to no tension in this rope from this rubber band just a tiny 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 little bit just enough to keep this seated in fact while you're cranking it and it's elevated if you stop well, i won't go, go into that that's uh beside outside of the scope of the experiment but <clears throat> Uh, nevertheless, uh, that's how we are able to control the tension in this string. It's by this rubber band, and that's why you may see this uh, rope attached to a hook with the rubber band. That isn't elevating our can. It's simply just seating the cord on the cylinder. So um, that is one part of the experiment I wanted to explain. <clears throat> If you were to go uh, in class, this is like a, a two to three uh, person um, experiment where one person obviously cranks and another person uh, counts the number of turns while someone watches the um, uh, digital multimeter <clears throat> so that he can let the person who's cranking know when to slow down and when to stop, or maybe it could just be done with two people. But I found this little count counter here. I kind of rigged it so I could do this by myself and I don't have to count the number of cranks. And uh, a lot of times I, I've seen students do, do this before it, uh, almost um, <laughs> without exception when, when, when all is said and done. At the end there's, there's always a little discussion, uh, a little debate like well, how many times did I crank it? You know there, there's always a little bit of confusion. Um, uh, you know, maybe where they're off by one, two, three, or four cranks. But anyway, we have this nice convenient counter that will give us N, the number of turns of this cylinder. And uh, let's see what else. Um, before I was trying to determine the temperature of the room with different thermometer, thermometers that I have there, they are thermometers. A uh, couple I got, um, typical thermometers you'd see in a chemistry lab. 
they're made to submerge in a liquid. I was trying to measure the temperature of this garage with them. Uh, there are two different types of thermometers giving me different values. In fact, I've got, got a meat thermometer and try to use that as well. And then I got a third value, so which one is right, right? Uh, anyway, it's important that uh, we know the temperature of the room because um, that helps us eliminate eliminate error in our experiment. If this is really um, uh, uh, warming up and I want to measure the that temperature, um, how can I accurately do that if this is a thermal contact with our environment? Um, through heat, the temperature is uh, increasing. <laughs> the, the, the air is getting hotter while well, this is getting uh, cooler. Well, this is heating up, but the, the air is uh, cooling it off at the same time. So um, as outlined in your lab manual, a way to circumvent that problem is to <clears throat> determine the temperature of the room, then start your experiment at a certain number of degrees below that temperature and finish your experiment that same amount of degrees above the room's temperature. And that's for obvious reasons, right? <clears throat> when this is really cold, the atmosphere will be warming it up. So we are going to be putting energy inadvertently into this cylinder. But then as it reaches the threshold of the temperature of this room, what happens in the reverse process, right? This is going to start heating up and energy is going to be escaping into the atmosphere. So if we start and stop the experiment at uh, equal amounts of temperature uh, below and above uh, the room's temperature, then we could assume that these losses or gains cancel each other out. So in our first run, we'll, we will start seven degrees below and end seven degrees above. And for our second run, we will start eight degrees below and, and end eight degrees above. And the reason why I'm changing it up is just so that we have totally different numbers uh, to analyze. Your lab manual instructs us to do this twice. So why do it twice under the same conditions, right? Let's do something a little more interesting than that. And do, 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 do. <clears throat> the temperature of this object, oh, by the way, so what temperature is the room if I have three different measurements with three different thermometers? Uh, what I'm going to do is just simply uh, plug this into our digital multimeter and wait till this becomes, <clears throat> um, uh, becomes uh, reaches equilibrium with, with, with the room. So the temperature of this um, after I leave it alone for a while, will indicate to us the temperature of the room, and we'll do it that way. And uh, the way we're, we are able to determine the temperature of this is simply by reading the resistance of the thermistor, which is uh, built inside of this cylinder. And there's a little chart here that um, lets us know what temperature this is as it pertains to what um, resistance the thermistor in here is uh, reading and um, I will do my best. I'm gonna get you a chart of this. I'll go to the PASCO website and see if I can download it. I'll provide that to you with um, your data sheet. Um, in your lab manual, <clears throat> there is a, an equation. There's a polynomial um, where if you input a resistance, it'll spit out a temperature for you. And the purpose of that is because um, this is uh, the resistances here are given in um, one degree increments and the resistances are quite large like from one degree to the next for uh, one uh, region I'm looking at is like 2,000 um, uh, ohms. So what if I stopped at 500 ohms away from one of these readings, right? What temperature is it? Um, to get a more accurate result, if you want, you could use that equation. Actually, I thought uh, the author of your manual got that equation from the PASCO website. I looked there and it's not there. So, what I suspect he did was <laughs> he painstakingly plotted all these numbers, these resistances and temperatures, and then just did a polynomial fit to that graph and provided it to you. So, there you go. If you want to be more accurate, you can use that. 
Um, yeah, because we may stop at a resistance that isn't directly um, on here, so we'd have to estimate or use that equation to get a more accurate reading. Um, I think that is it. Um, there's a lot of uh, little details on how you're to, uh, to do this experiment, the way in which you're supposed to crank it. And it's like if this is a perfectly level, the, the, the rope on this cylinder will get tangled up on itself. But, um, you know, I can go on and on, but I'll just uh, hammer out all those little details on my own <clears throat> and make sure that this is working uh, properly. And then we'll do the experiment together. So uh, there you go. There you have it. We are going to start. Um, momentarily and the overall experiment doesn't take long it takes a lot of effort on my part because um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you got to crank it fast and for a while so uh, I'm gonna get kind of winded but anyway um, we are going to get good results I'm sure of it so let me put you on pause and get started okay ladies and gentlemen I have our cylinder cooled off I've wiped it down so there's uh, not much well no water on it you'll see a post-it there with a couple of columns the first column on the left pertains to the resistances of interest the first one 109.85 that is in kilo ohms pertains to when I want to start cranking and that indicates a temperature of 23 degrees Celsius. The second one there, 60.74, that is when I want to uh, drastically decrease the rate of cranking. It's one degree uh, smaller than our target uh, temperature, target temperature being 37 degrees Celsius. So when we reach 37 degrees Celsius, that is when I am going to stop cranking altogether and the resistance that the multimeter will show in that case is 58.14 kilo ohms. So we are almost at 109.85 and I'll get ready. And um, it's pretty hot in this garage. I turned the air conditioner off so that uh, we have better uh, audio quality. I'm gonna be huffing and puffing. So um, bear with me here. So we're almost there and uh, we want 109.85 we are a thousand ohms off almost there hopefully this goes well because it's uh, it could be a bit tedious uh, to set this up each time um, but hopefully we don't have to go there. Let's see how well this works. So we're almost there and I'm going to start cranking shortly. And here we go. for 60.74 slowly slowly 58.14 I'm waiting temperature I got to was 57.9 57.9 so let me put you on pause and crunch these numbers be back in a second
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's do this another time here. And uh, what we're gonna do is mix up the values a bit. By the way, here is our cylinder in the plastic bag, which in turn was in some cold water, <clears throat> some ice water, so hopefully it's cold enough. And uh, what I did was I posted there on the multimeter some new values, some new begin and end uh, temperatures. Uh, just to make the analysis a little bit more interesting, uh, we'll have different numbers uh, to play with. So, instead of beginning uh, 7 degrees below and ending seven, degree, 7 degrees above room temperature, we'll do 8. And those values there pertain to 8 above and 8 below. So. We're going to start cranking when we reach 115.19 kilo ohms, which pertains to 22 degrees Celsius. Now, our, our cylinder is uh, quite moist, a lot of uh, water condensation, so let me wipe it down here. And hopefully I don't, um, in the process, cool it, or I'm sorry, warm it. Wow, it's really jumping up. Jumping up in resistance, meaning registering at a lower temperature. So, okay, um, <clears throat> all that means was it was sitting in, in ice water in a plastic bag. The outer surface was colder than the inner surface where the uh, thermistor is uh, located. So it's taking a, a bit of time for that thermistor to um, uh, register uh, the temperature of the unit as a whole. 144, okay, we got some time. What I think I'll do is uh, put you on pause while this um, warms up a bit. And that's just in the interest of um, you getting bored with watching the numbers on this multimeter slowly decrease. Okay, let me put you on pause and I'll get back to you in a second. Okay, so we are almost ready to start cranking. We are waiting for 115.19 kilo ohms. And what I wanna do is crank this, I guess, as fast as I can. Now, if I crank it slow, the same force is going to be applied. Same exact force. That, that there's no that speed isn't involved in the force that this creates in our <clears throat> analysis, right? So why do I want to do it as fast as I can? Bottom line is I want to do this experiment as quickly as possible uh, because that uh, uh, um, allows a minimal amount of energy to be transferred into the environment. So here we go, almost there. <clears throat> All right, I probably should get ready for this. I'm gonna get winded. Uh, okay, so we're about 20, um, 200 ohms away. So, all right, here goes. I just switched hands. I'm gonna try and switch hands again. I want to stop.
55.5 was our lowest uh, resistance, 55.5 kilo ohms. All right, let me put you on pause. Before I forget, here is the top of our uh, Pasco um, crank, and that is to show you our number of turns in. So there you go. All right, back on pause. Ladies and gentlemen, under normal circumstances, I don't go over any of the uh, uh, theoretical aspects of the lab or, or the details of the equipment that we're using. I just assume that you've totally read and understood uh, your lab manual and you've had a, a, a full lecture from your instructor and perhaps have even read your textbook. So uh, why did I do that this time? I don't know. I, I, uh, this particular lab I find very interesting. Um, maybe I wanted to change it up a bit. In the future, I don't know if I will continue to give any kind of uh, theoretical background, but um, I just com felt compelled to do so this time, I guess, because like I said, I find it interesting. I hope you found it useful. The other thing is, from my experience, when I'm learning, learning a new concept, I always appreciate hearing it explained twice, three times, for the more the better and um, it, it, it's it's a benefit sometimes to hear it again from a different person or whatever but um, there you go and uh, that concludes this lab I will see you next week